Okay. Um, before I introduce our esteemed speaker, I would like to go through our land acknowledgement, understanding that many of the folks here do the work of reconciliation with our indigenous partners, do the work of trying to figure out how can we work towards a situation of trust and accountability with native Californians, with native North Americans, with our partners in South Africa and elsewhere. We do the work. And so taking away one of our resources to do that work is um, anathema to what this university supposedly is about. So just think about thinking about through this land acknowledgement, not just the words, but the deeds and the actual labor of doing the work is happening here and don't hamstring us. The archaeological research facility is lo located in Huichin, the ancestral and unceded territory of Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community, we inherit a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and made attempts to erase living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance and practice, right, what we do in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all Native and Indigenous peoples. No. No. So today, coming all the way up from the redwoods of Santa Cruz, we have Jacob Stone, who's going to be talking about the Reverend Hirahara Farmstead, which... I think it was first kind of explored by Rob Edwards, right? In the Correct. Castile Field School back in like the late 90s. Um, right. Great stories. I can't wait to hear. Jacob is a PhD candidate under the tutelage of some former Berkeley products at the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. As an historical archaeologist, his dissertation research focuses on the incarceration of Japanese Americans on the West Coast of the United States you during World War II. Major $5. themes explored in his work include internment archaeology in varying contexts, the Asian diaspora, and the experiences of Japanese civilians as they moved across the globe and into the U.S., as well as how community, place, and material culture can enliven us, enlighten us, sorry, to the experiences of many who are held in incarceration centers. Jacob believes this research impacts a large breadth of detainees, refugees, and all displaced persons across the globe today who may similarly be forming communities and persevering during these disruptive circumstances. He's also spent eight years in the CRM field which encourages a critical look at how archaeologists manage, curate, and archive artifact collections. Thus, his research explores how archaeologists can give back to the communities and present orphaned collections in a way that is informative, but also respectful and beneficial for our, all parties involved. Please join me in welcoming Jacob to the ARF. Where is the sun? Uh, well, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Um, my name is Jacob Stone, and like you mentioned, I'm from UCSC. I'm a fifth-year graduate student there. And today I'm just going to be talking a little bit about my dissertation project. This one is what? Mostly work on there at school. This is what? So to get right into it, um, I'd like to start with sort of uh, outlining some of my main goals for the project, some of the main questions I'm trying to answer. Actually, in that intro, it was so comprehensive. We talked a little bit about some of these things. Um, but again, um, trying to look uh, specifically at a post-war journey of Japanese American and carceries is really the main focus of this project, as I feel the Hirohara House has a really unique sort of opportunity to look at that time frame um, compared to a lot of other Japanese American sites around here. Um, also to showcase the story of the Redmond Hirahara House in general and its legacy as part of the Watsonville community. And then, like mentioned, also um, sort of handling orphan collections and archival materials in general. So this was not a collection that I came into Santa Cruz having or thinking I was going to be working with. Um, I actually started doing slavery plantations in Haiti. Um, but this was an orphan collection that came to us at UCSC, and I've really had a great time sort of thinking through how myself as a historical archeologist and others can use these materials to sort of share new perspectives um, on the collection. And so just a couple main questions here then, really generally, how did incarceration affect the lives of Japanese Americans during and after World War II? How did this impact the community of Watsonville? 
And naturally being an archeological dissertation, right? What material evidence is there for this transformation of consumer practices or ethnic representation within these contexts um, and communities? And you'll have to bear with me for 15 minutes or so here. I decided to start with a lot of background, a lot of ethnographic research. So we'll just, we'll get into the house a little bit later. I just wanted to give a sort of set the scene here and let us know where we're talking about and sort of the history of the area. And so primarily I'm focused in the Northern California Monterey Bay region. So um, Watsonville is where the house is located, but this project has led me to uh, other really prominent Japan towns like in San Francisco, like San Jose and like Monterey. And so really we're looking at um, this Pajaro Valley region is really the farming area around Watsonville. And uh, in this area, you know, the most dense sort of Japanese immigration here really began in the mid 1800s to the late 1800s, specifically in Watsonville. Uh, most of the time, this first uh, Issei generation of immigrants um, went to Hawaii first to work on the sugar plantations there. Um, some went from Hawaii to the West Coast, some went directly from Japan to California. But in general, those are sort of the two main areas here where that uh, initial immigration happened. And this was mostly um, young Japanese men um, because they sort of uh, were able to work these seasonal positions and highly intensive labor um, um, and a variety of fields, right? So plantations in Hawaii, but in um, the United States, we have logging camps, mines, fisheries, uh, farms like in Watsonville, really a whole diversity of uh, different fields here. And a lot of these immigrants were very highly educated with four to eight years of um, compulsory education in Japan at this time. And many people argue that this is why they found uh, so much success and really revolutionized a lot of these businesses um, in the area. Um, but of course, despite some successes, uh, there was a lot of um, roadblocks in the way for many of these immigrants. And, Really, I just uh, I won't go through all of these legislations, but I just want to show that very early on in the early 1900s, um, a lot of these laws and legislations that are sort of targeting Chinese immigrants already here in California um, were sort of just moved over to encompass Japanese Americans and people of Asian descent in general. Some of these um, in particular are the Gentleman Agreement of 1908 restricting um, the migration of unskilled laborers from Japan, uh, and really a really impactful one, the California Alien Land Law of 1913, which denied the rights of all immigrants and Japanese uh, immigrants to purchase property. And so this uh, massively impacted sort of the experience of Japanese people coming to Watsonville and, and around the area. Um, later, uh, that right to buy property was sort of amended and, and tied more to the ability for them to become citizens. So we'll see there's some gray areas there and working around that. Um, but just so you know, there's a lot of sort of uh, legislations already here in the early 1900s that sort of lead to the incarceration. Incarceration doesn't really come out of nowhere, so to speak. Um, and just really quickly to talk about Japanese American incarceration in World War II. Um, so on December 7, 1941, um, Pearl Harbor was attacked and war on Japan was declared the following day from the U.S. Um, it was about a year later that Executive Order 9066 was signed by President Roosevelt. And this is what created the actual sort of official exclusion area. And you can see that thick um, black line on the, on the West Coast. So all Japanese people within that boundary were relocated sort of east into these um, relocation camps and in incarceration camps. And on this map here, you'll see the, the big red triangles are sort of the, the official war re relocation authority, uh, the big sort of 10 camps that existed like Manzanar in Central California, like Granada, Granada and Amache and, and uh, Colorado, these sorts of places. But you also see a number of um, other dots on here. The little black dots are sort of these temporary assembly centers established um, very hastily to sort of a preemptive move for many of these people before they were sent onto the main um, WRA camps. And so 
just taking another look here um, at sort of the expanse of this. It does go all the way to the Mississippi in the US. I have a big gold star on Rower all the way in Arkansas. That's where the Hirahara family actually ended up being incarcerated. So we'll keep that in mind for now. Um, and as I, or as we mentioned in sort of the intro, I approach this as sort of a more general framework of archeology span of internment in general. And this was something that really appealed to me when I was an undergraduate student doing historical archeology. span And I really loved this book by Adrian Myers the sort of edited volume that framed um, internment in sort of a, a more broader sense of just the restriction of movement of people. And so it was able to sort of be applied then to many locations, such as um, Nazi Germany concentration camps. As you can see, sort of reference on the side, those are pictures from excavations there. Um, as well as I looked at slavery plantations, like I mentioned, uh, contemporary refugee camps even today housing um, uh, Syrian refugees. Um, this was in 2017 that I did that. But um, just taking a look more generally and thinking about, you know, what is similar about these experiences? What's different? Are there any similarities? And uh, importantly for me, you know, what are the material culture for coming from these excavations really saying? I found that to be really fascinating because um, often the narratives around these spaces are construed or or not um, portrayed correctly. And I found archeology span really had a great opportunity here to sort of ground truth some things and those experiences with materials in the camps. And um, just a quick look at some archeology span going on in Japanese American incarceration camps. There is a lot of amazing scholars doing work in um, camps across the country. Primarily this is like Jeffrey Burton at Manzanar or um, Bonnie Clark at Amache um, with her students as well. Um, but there's a range of different topics that people cover in archeology span within the camps themselves. So consumption, um, gender expression, artwork. Um, there's sort of a big look at the gardens that were created during World War II, um, you know, illicit activities like sake being uh, made in the barracks, these sorts of things. But really importantly, um, in the last, uh, really the last three years or so since 2020, there's been a major, major push from a lot of the Japanese diaspora scholars to look outside of this single five years of incarceration and doing archeology span only in the camps. And so often, you know, there's these edited volumes made and there's no archeology span to be seen um, post the incarceration camps, post 1945. Um, there's some pre-war archeology, span there's, um, logging camps that are looked at in Canada, for example. There's some, but even there, there's a big push these days to really look at these surrounding periods and try to construct that timeline more thoroughly. Um, and so again, that's what I hope to really do here with this project. Um, theory and home in place, I'm gonna go quickly through this as well for the sake of time, but just to say that um, through doing this research, you know, I started uh, with this collection of materials, sort of analyzing it uh, from my archeological perspective. But this uh, project has really become uh, quite ethnographic as well in terms of the information and, and understanding the experience, right? Not only the Hirahara family, but other Japanese families in Watsonville in particular. And so thinking about um, um, the Japanese landscape as it's often called, and this landscape really goes along with sort of the idea of place or place theory that sort of posits this landscape as just all the alterations and the effects that the Japanese community had in Watsonville. And we see that landscape being developed in the camps and we see it from really primarily the Japan towns that formed in a lot of these areas. Um, so yeah, linking it to there. But now I do wanna talk a bit a more about Watsonville in particular, right? So Watsonville was sort of where I started. And when I was first thinking about this um, project, you know, the Hirahara family had a really unique journey and they did end up returning back to their home after the war um, to Watsonville. And a lot of questions that I received and questions that I had were, why might people want to return to where they were excluded from? What were those motivation factors, you know, um, they were all the way in Arkansas, right? That's not an easy uh, journey. What was that pull 
And so I started looking into sort of um, people's accounts of living in Watsonville, in this community. And you'll see really quickly here that actually the Japantown in Watsonville became exceptionally prominent in the area. Um, you know, as early as 1896, um, the newspaper is estimating 400 Japanese farm laborers in that Pajaro Valley. So that's not in Watsonville City proper, but in the region doing farming. Um, the first rental agreement in Watsonville in 1901. Um, and Sandy Leiden wrote a, a great book about the Japantown here, um, positing that, you know, by 1910, this Japantown really started forming on the south side of town. Um, and by 1920 through 1940, it was one of the densest urban concentration of Japanese in the region, including San Jose and San Francisco and these places as well. So really, really prominent. And I just wanted to show some of this uh, really uh, simplified census data here that's looking at counties. So we have Santa Cruz County that basically includes Watsonville and Santa Cruz City. Um, and you can see this population kind of rising or at least staying the same through time more or less in Monterey and Santa Cruz. But then looking at 1950, right, as we might expect that population dramatically decreased. Um, so here, 1950, this then has it by city, but you know, if we take Watsonville and Santa Cruz and um, look at it compared to that 1300 number in the county before, clearly there was a big decrease there. So again, thinking what may have uh, in particular driven the Hirahara family to come back when it was such a challenging journey. And here's just a little um, depiction of that uh, Japan town that was made in Watsonville right around 1920. Um, and you can see um, kind of here in the, on the bottom right of the map on the left, this is really focused in those bolded outlined buildings or where uh, the properties were owned by Japanese um, people or, or people were working there. Um, and really this was a huge range of businesses, right? Um, anything from the uh, Japanese American Civilians League that started to form right around this time um, to barber shops, uh, bike repair, gas stations, um, uh, really a, a wide diversity of businesses here. And it also stretches um, across the river. So this is located on the south end of Watsonville, right on Main Street. So kind of on the east and west and you can see uh, that next map follows down below Main Street across the river, and there's a couple buildings there as well. That was actually where the Chinatown uh, predated this um, Japantown that was made. And that's a quite common occurrence where, um, you know, this region was not a very highly desirable location. It was, it's very prone to flooding. Maybe you've seen the Pajaro Valley floods in the recent weeks. Um, this is right where we're talking about, right where that flooding is happening. Um, so pretty common to uh, double up in that sense. And here is um, a really awesome resource from Densho, the online repository um, for a lot of Japanese American diaspora sort of research and archival research. And this map, uh, this is called like Sites of Shame here. Um, and it allows you to, it's really neat. You can click on any city and it'll show you how many uh, people were there before World War II, where um, people were generally traveling to, and the number of people who returned. So it doesn't follow individual families per se, but it'll say 300 people left from Watsonville to Poston, Arizona, and 500 came back or something like this. And looking at these numbers, um, I just decided to do a couple of these cities that I was looking in, like Watsonville, San Francisco, San Jose, and Monterey, where I knew they have these still prominent uh, Japan towns today. And um, in Watsonville, just like before from the census data, we see uh, after World War II, there's a sharp sort of decline in that population, um, um, just like San Francisco as well. So I had one idea that maybe people, instead of coming back to Watsonville, they were kind of drawn to the larger cities nearby, like San Jose for maybe labor opportunities or something. But San Francisco was sort of a, a surprise in that sense, because even San Francisco, that might have a lot of draws in that sense, lost nearly half its population. But when we look at places like San Jose and Monterey, they actually gained some numbers. So again, this might not say that everyone who left San Jose specifically came back, but certainly more people came back to San Jose um, from the region in general. 
So thinking, why might that be? And this is where we really get into that sort of um, community perseverance in these spaces that um, often a lot of people suggest it was a huge motivation here. And these are just some photos I took um, within the last year um, in San Jose. And you can see how visible this place remains today. And we think about the Japanese landscape and the impacts. In San Jose, you'll find um, placards and signposts all over um, listing and sharing sort of this, these experience and just showcasing how this really happened here. That's quite different from Watsonville, for example, where it's not really as public um, there. And we can see that in the uh, Japanese American Civilians League here in San Jose on the top right, that really nice sort of blue and white building, um, really beautiful. They're adding um, Japanese gardens to it around the outside of it these days just really uh, showcasing that presence there, as well as the uh, Buddhist church in the top left here. That was one of the few buildings to have an architectural style really from um, you know, the East, so to speak. Um, and that's uh, exceptionally rare here. So in San Jose, uh, we have some really prominent features to look at. And that's one of the main um, arguments sort of that I talk about this, these Japan towns and the communities that they form there the support systems they formed really allowed for people to return at all, you know, if it was uh, possible at all, they really needed that. And so that'll be our transition to the Redmond Hirahara house itself and sort of the experience of the Hirahara family. And it relates to that in, in quite a few ways and hopefully you'll see that as well. Um, but here's a couple images of the house. Um, so on the left-hand side, that was shortly after it was built. So that's about 1905 there with the Redmond family on the porch. Um, on the right is when the house was excavated by um, Rob Edwards at Cabrillo University. Um, so that was in 2005. Um, so it looks quite similar to that today, maybe a, a little different. I'll have a few updated pictures later. But um, in the middle is just sort of an aerial view of the city of Watsonville. And so in the middle um, here, uh, you can see where the river goes. So that is where on the north and south side of that river is where the Japantown is. That little red circle there is where the Hirahara farmstead actually was. So this is not, you know, right in the city proper, but it is um, a couple miles away um, and pretty close right there in Watsonville. And so this uh, farmstead or the Victorian uh, house itself was built by the Redmond family in 1897 after already working on the land since 1890 or 1883, sorry, when it was purchased by John Redmond. Um, and John had um, his first wife who passed away while he was living there. And he had a second wife, Ela Redmond, who also unfortunately passed away in 1937. And it was only at that point where um, John Redmond put the property up for sale. And this was when um, it was purchased by Katsumi Tao uh, by auction. And the Tao family um, knew the Hirahara family. They both were in Watsonville already at this time. And they were actually uh, bound by marriage in a few places. Um, and so the Taos, um, actually passed down uh, the farmstead to Fumio Hirahara in 1940 for like a dollar or whatever, right? Sort of under the table, um, pass it down. And why could Fumio um, purchase the property? Well, Fumio was um, the children, or one of the children of Matoshi and Teo Hirahara, who were first generation immigrants, not citizens of the US, couldn't own property. But Fumio was born in the U.S., um, so he was 16 at this time, um, and he was able to put his name on the property and sort of uh, do that official transfer. So it was in 1940 that Fumio, his parents, and eight of his siblings, so 11 total members of the Hirahara family, moved in to this house. Um, here on the right is a really uh, pretty family tree. Uh, given to me by Naomi Hirahara, made by Katsuji Hirahara. Um, and that red circle are sort of, and there's red underlines there showing the 11 members who I'm talking about. It's a little blurry, but you'll see Mitoshi and Teo there on the left 
and a bunch of their children on the right. Um, and naturally, you know, this is already 1940. So um, pretty quickly, um, the war was sort of escalating and tensions were building. And actually, this is kind of why the Hirahara family ended up going to Arkansas compared to many uh, other people in Watsonville. So um, in Watsonville, when that exclusion order was first being placed and they were sending out these notices um, to people, um, Watsonville actually had a unique mandate at first, which was not the full exclusion zone, but just that everyone had to move east of that main street. Um, so at first, it wasn't, you know, all of Watsonville being evacuated. It's just everyone to the west of Main Street trying to push people inland. And obviously this was devastating to that Japantown we just looked at that had tons and a number of businesses on, that, um, on the west side of the street. But in addition, the Hirahara family had to move from their farmstead right away, just a couple of years later, right? Um, first, they moved back to their home in Watsonville, and there's not as many records about this move. It was fairly temporary. Um, we know from the Hane family, actually, probably what happened. But um, essentially, they moved back to Watsonville, east of that main street, and then actually just sort of sensing where things were going, they decided to try to move to Fresno, to sort of escape all of it in general and not deal with it. Um, but in Fresno was where actually the full exclusion order kind of happened. So it was when the Hirahara family was staying in Fresno. Thus, they were um, sent to the Fresno Assembly Center and from there all the way to Rower in Arkansas. And that's pretty unique because the vast majority of Japanese Americans in Watsonville would have been um, most likely taken to the Salinas Temporary Center, the racetrack there in Salinas, and from there to Poston in Arizona, some to Manzanar as well, but primarily to Poston. So already we have sort of a unique journey of the Hirahara family in that sense. Um, but really notably, while the family was in um, Rower, you know, not all of them stayed for the duration in the camps. Um, as they're outside of this exclusion area now, students like Fumio, who would have been right around college age at this time, actually went to Chicago to pursue his education. So you could, he was still able to you know, apply to college and get this acceptance letter and sort of move out. Move out. And you know, this was um, par for the course for many people as well. So when I say the family returned, it wasn't all of them but a good number of them um, who were still in the camp. Um, and then just a little note, Jerome actually ended up closing earlier than most camps. It was just two miles away from Rower. So actually they spent the first couple of years in the Jerome camp, and then everyone when Jerome closed was moved to Rower uh, you know, on June 30, 1944 for the remaining year of the incarceration. And so, some of the Hirahara family, mostly Esamu, Susumu, and Shiguru, returned to their farmstead on June 4th, 1945, and uh, with a number of children um, that they had at this time as well. Um, and here's a photo of them sort of reconvening on the porch right there in 1945. Um, but of course, they weren't the only family trying to return to Watsonville. Um, the Hiraharas were lucky in some sense because they had a lawyer who they knew and a gardener who was able to watch and manage their property while they were away. But of course, not everyone had that luxury, like the Hane family. And here in the bottom left, you'll see Akihiro Hane um, pictured. Uh, the Hanes came back to Watsonville in 1946, um, him and his wife, and found that their home had been essentially looted and sold. Um, to someone else. So they had lost their property in these, um, in these five or four to five years that they were away. Um, but really, uniquely, again, the Hirahara family uh, actually took in the Hane family and let them stay in their barn behind the house. And not only did they let the Hane family stay in the barn for the next three to four years, but also numerous other uh, individual laborers and the Tao family as well, who came back, who we know they had connections to before. Um, some interviews with um, members of the Hirahara family who are no longer with us suggest up to half a dozen different families staying at this barn in some uh, point in time, right? So it creates this really, really interesting sort of multi-habitation context there on the site. And so this was sort of um, 
you know, when these excavations began, there was no uh, real idea of this connection to the Hirohara family or the Japanese American incarceration in general. These excavations were done because the house was put on the um, National Register of Historic Places, but it was listed on the register for the architect who created it with no connections to this sort of um, Japanese American experience here. And thus, when they were doing these excavations, um, really the only goal was to figure out what the foundations were like around this house. Um, and so they put sort of these four trenches around the house, um, right up against it and sort of dug down to try to understand, you know, get to the foundations and see what was going on. Um, and this is where we would kind of consider most of the artifacts belonging to the house coming from these four trenches. And that's where we get uh, about 3,000 artifacts, you know, a range of artifacts, ceramics, glass, faunal materials, architectural materials, metal, really all sorts of stuff coming from here. And here, I just have a, a nice uh, map here of that. So those yellow highlighted squares around the house are sort of where those excavations happened, um, as well as sort of a general surface um, pedestrian survey of the farmstead and some surface skimming of some key areas, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, and I'll focus now here on trench two, and I'm not gonna go super deep and specific artifacts today, but to get a sense of kind of what we're looking at, Trench 2 is kind of unique because it has the vast majority of materials. Almost all of them came from Trench 2. Just looking at like the kitchen wares by weight, for example, it has almost all of them. You can see here is a little process of them excavating it. Here's a little um, profile of it. So you can see there's some stratigraphic layers that they um, divvied up when they did these excavations. Um, these days with the materials and after analyzing it, that stratigraphy is not as strong as maybe we would like it to be. Um, there's materials that sort of found scattered throughout these trenches. So oftentimes when I think of trench two, it's just trench two altogether, not thinking about these, uh, you know, separate depositional events, um, which is a shame because that might have been uh, a little bit easier to sort of tying in these direct, um, you know, habitation periods. Um, Here's just a, a little sample of some of the materials here and some of the ceramics coming from Trench 2. Um, so a range of, uh, you know, import, European import ceramics, um, sort of this flow blue on the bottom right and some transfer prints um, mixed in with some um, sort of unique finds like this Koamari style bowl you'll see at the bottom left. And uh, this is something that we actually used to date the um, the trenches more or less because we knew that this was a family heirloom passed down by the Hirohara family. Um, but uh, just one example of some of the really sort of neat things coming out from here. And uh, really basically I've sort of analyzed a lot of these materials, mostly looking at the kitchen wares, trying to look at things that people were using for consumption because a lot of these sort of uh, statistical elements of this is just trying to see if there's a change of material culture over time with these different um, uh, folks living there. So we have like the European Redmond family, early 1900s to the Hirohara family to beyond. And so trying to delineate these different contexts is a, a really big goal. And some of that has worked out pretty well. Some of that hasn't worked out very well. Um, it's Turns out it's quite a challenge to try to find, you know, just a five year difference in time with these uh, um, trenches in general. Um, but I'll show in a sec some of these uh, really um, fascinating contexts that speak to some of our main questions here, such as this uh, carriage barn, right? So this barn was where um, the other, the Hane family was staying. And you'll see on the bottom right, this was just a little, um, artist's rendition of uh, Aki's um, thoughts and remembering of how that space was organized. So you can see a couple different rooms given to different families. He has the Hane family, the Tao family um, there. And this um, barn, you can see it was in pretty rough shape. That's a photo of it in 2005. It's no longer standing. It's uh, completely demolished today. But fortunately, um, during this field school and during the excavations, they were able to sort of do a little survey of the barn. 
And what they found here was a number of really interesting um, text documents all along the walls. And so this was like a layering of different texts, some um, Watsonville newspapers in English and Japanese. Um, there is um, a whole booklet that was more than likely this um, autobiography here of a uh, anarchist in Japan. And um, theorizing, you know, why uh, these text documents have been here has been a really interesting um, part of this collection as well. And at first, you know, there's a lot of ideas that maybe this was just to sort of separate the spaces, make it a little more homey, add some decoration to the walls, these sort of things, separate the rooms. Um, but there are other suspicions that perhaps this was the Hirahara family sort of um, minimalizing their connection with uh, Japan. And, you know, around 1942, when the incarceration was going down, that's a very common um, experience that many people suggest, that they burned documents, they burned letters, for example, that was sent, just correspondence with Japan, anything that might tie them to the empire, right, to sort of uh, um, hopefully, you know, divert suspicions away or something like this. Um, but really, really interesting context. And also there are other um, theories that, for example, a samurai sword, with, sword was buried on this farmstead, sort of this urban legend, right? But thinking about um, hiding these materials in that way and thinking about, you know, why might have these documents been where they were in the barn? It's really um, fascinating. And in addition, I just wanted to point out some of these saws that we found. Um, you know, when I got this collection, I'm reading through all of the notes and sort of how they labeled things. You can see these saws on the right are, are from the collection, and they were all labeled as Japanese saws. And I thought that was a little bit strange. I didn't really know what they meant by a Japanese saw, but it looked like a sickle kind of. So I'm like, oh, you know, I'll just uh, call it a saw and move on and maybe look into it later. And so like any good researcher, I went on Google and I typed in Japanese saw just to see what would pop up. And all sorts of brands came up looking almost identical. So like, for example, this guy here on the top um, looks almost identical to these saws. And sure enough, these are termed a uh, Japanese style sickle or primarily these are used for bonsai gardening. Um, and so here again, you know, thinking about these materials, it's a real challenge to sort of tie ethnicity to some materials, right? Archeologically, like a Japanese saw, what does that even mean? Well, here there is some implications that we do have these, um, I mean, proudly Japanese made stainless steel um, sort of bonsai gardening saws. And this is also really um, interesting because it ties into the last sort of main context here on the farmstead, which is the garden that they made. And this garden is really, really um, important to a lot of this research because um, when I'm talking about scholars who are looking for these trends and changes of practice following the incarceration, actually creating gardens like this is one of the main trends that people are looking to. So. Um, in the camps themselves, it's well known, like Manzanar, they're reconstructing a new Japanese garden they find every year. I think they're up to like 17 now that they're remaking. This is a very prominent practice that was done within the camps. And Bonnie Clark and others suggest that it was from that experience that many people took that home with them and continued these gardens at home. And sure enough, here at the Hirahara farmstead, Matoshi uh, created a bonsai garden right when he returned back to his farmstead. Um, you know, mostly for himself and to give to other members of his family. Um, but in, in addition to the saws, we have a sort of surface skim of this garden. So this garden is really, really crucial in sort of having that context that is uh, rooted post-1945 for sure, right? Because we can look at those trenches all day long and sure the Hirahara family maybe put stuff in there at some point, but that could have easily been the Redmond family as well, who were there for 40 years beforehand. Whereas this garden really only was created post-1945. So looking at some of the materials coming from the garden, comparing it to that other collection that we have from the trenches themselves, um, can hopefully speak more to sort of this change in practice over time, a change in materials, a change in material culture, um, and sort of showcase this 
community elements as well here at the Hirar Farmstead. How they took in all these additional families and were able to offer that support. I think it really speaks to, in general, this perseverance of the Japantown and that community overall. And it's something that I see today when I go to San Jose and I go to Watsonville. And something I think is really well represented here in this story. Um, you know, there's some other cool things here, uh, like planter tags. So what they actually may have been planting there in the garden, sort of scribbled with the Japanese text over it. Um, you know, those sorts of things. Um, and so, although the garden wasn't fully excavated, uh, they had a little surface skin. And like I said, the barn actually never had any excavations under the ground there. So thinking about additional excavations on the farmstead with the Hirahara family has been something I've been doing, you know, for the duration of this project and thinking about the change of the landscape. And you can see over time, I like this map because 1930 and 1950, it's sort of out on its own. But today, if you're driving down Highway 1 southbound from Santa Cruz in between Watsonville, the highway actually runs right, um, right alongside it. So you get a great view of this house. Um, it's where everyone comes and says, you know, I see this house all the time. I never knew what it was. I thought it was haunted or these things, you know, this is what I get uh, quite often. So even just sharing the story in the, in, of the Hirahara family really has brought me um, a lot of joy in, in a lot of ways. And you'll see here is what the house um, looks like today. Um, and so what they did once they sort of found those foundations uh, and to preserve it um, is sort of lifted up from its foundations and it's on all sorts of wood beams there. So the idea is if the area continues to develop like it is, like they've got a hotel behind it and a gas station now, basically they would just move it somewhere else. Um, you know, whether or not that's uh, super effective is yet to be seen. There was a bunch of money raised to um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, recreate this house or, or you know manage it and, and uh, bring it back to life but um, that money was sort of uh, mysteriously lost a couple million dollars with the Redmond family um, and that's actually a big reason why the Hirahara family has been quite hesitant about getting into this big gung-ho project to do it again because they had this experience before in about 2005 to 2008 and they're just quite hesitant to do it again um, so that's sort of where it is now. Again, it is listed on the National Register, but only for the architect who made it. No, um, you know, connections to the historical significance of the of the location, like I might um, think of, right? Um, but in general, um, you know, to conclude here and, and think of the future, um, we have this collection of materials that is at UCSC because Cabrillo ran out of room. Um, so, you know, we don't have infinite space either. Uh, Sim Schneider, uh, thankfully, took it in his lab, but, you know, he also doesn't know, uh, you know, we talk about all the time, what can we do with it? And so I've been really working hard to try to find a repository um, around, like, the Pajaro Valley Historical Society in Watsonville, I think would be amazing. We've talked about it a little bit. They're short for space, too, so we'll see. Um, the San Jose um, Japanese American Civilians League or the Japanese American Museum there in San Jose has shown some interest. Or there's a bunch of sort of online repositories, which we might have to do sort of just digitize the collection and get it out there in that way. Um, but yeah, that's sort of where I am right now, currently sort of working through this, where we can store these materials. Also, you know, using the story and, and stretching it out to Watsonville and San Jose and just the community there and, and um, in these places and how supportive they were in one another and arguably why this return was even made possible and why these Japan towns are so prominent as they are today was really from people like the Hirahara family and others. Um, lastly, I guess I'll just conclude by saying, you know, like I said, I came into this with sort of a broader look at incarceration spaces. And so I hope to use this research and looking at, you know, the incarceration camps themselves and looking at spaces like this to try to see if there are any patterns that are created. You know, they're all sort of this barrack style housing, for example. Um, we find that in concentration camps, to Japanese American incarceration camps, to refugee camps today. So although these places might have very different stories and backgrounds, you know, the way people are organized here seems really uh, similar in a lot of ways. And looking through material culture in these places as well, I think, 
can really speak to sort of the true history in these places and the true experience of, of those people. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you very much for, for listening. Or Jacob. Sure, yeah. Yes, I actually have kind of two questions. One is just factual, which is you mentioned that the Hiraharas came back in June of 45, which yeah. is actually before Japan surrendered. Yeah. So that's kind of a factual question. Why would they even be let out? But yeah. the, the broader and totally different question I have is relationships between different groups that had uh, immigrant had immigrated from Asia at different times. So you mentioned the Chinese, you got the mm -hmm. Japanese, the Filipinos were often going to Stockton, including some of my in-laws. Um, and I wonder in this whole context of executive order 9066, mm -hmm. whether there was support or even antagonism or any relationship between the different mm. groups of people. I'd be curious to know about that. That's a great question. For the first part of the question, we don't really know actually why they were there early. Um, some ideas are that Fumio had this opportunity to go to school and some of the other families were looking into this. Some ideas are just that their home, somehow they worked it out with the lawyer and the gardener who were managing it, that they were like, oh, they should come back and sort of work the land or something. But it's not exactly clear exactly why they were able to, like the Hanes were, uh, you know, quite a time later by train. Um, could have been the distance they were going, maybe because they were traveling so far. But unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for you on, on that one. Um, in terms of, you know, other uh, immigrant communities, just like you mentioned, uh, the Chinese population really prominent in Watsonville, the Filipino population. Um, it's very, very common that in these, you know, the Japantown area, so to speak, that all of these different immigrant communities would have been around that same area. So specifically, I'm thinking of excavations in, in San Jose, Japantown. What you really find are immigrants from all over, of all sorts of different um, backgrounds living in those regions. And again, that's often because those were undesirable locations, prone to flooding, not, uh, you know, cheap. Um, um, uh, in Watsonville, it happened to be that they had a good relationship with the police officer there in Watsonville who really supported that community there. So a lot of people were drawn there for that sort of protection in a sense in that community. But in terms of antagonism, really, that was mostly white uh, folks, um, you know, putting out a, a lot of prejudice and racism in Watsonville in particular, um, signs, not allowing them into businesses, um, um, a lot of arson in the Japan town, um, you know, uh, just a couple of years after it was completely burned down. There was, um, you know, uh, the head editor of the Watsonville Pejorian newspaper said, like, how can we remove these people essentially from our city in a really public forum? So there was a lot of these prejudices going on, but mostly from, from the white wealthy farmers actually, who were likely intimidated by the success of the Japanese community who were really um, being successful farmers and fisher people around the area. So, yeah. Um, Th thanks. R really interesting. Uh, a lot of good material, a nice presentation. Thank you. Um, a question I have, uh, you know, a really impressive number of artifacts. Do you happen to know if um, you've got anything that would indicate um, having visited or purchased uh, memorabilia at the Treasure Island Fair? And I don't know if you're making mm -hmm. any linkages there, because I think there are potentially some very interesting One linkages. of the main goals we had at the beginning was trying to see, you know, where are these materials coming from? Are they, mm -hmm. are they being purchased by the family locally in Watsonville? You know, we know there's European uh, ceramics, but we have the Koamari bowl. Was that actually from Japan? Mm -hmm. These sorts of things. Um, the only thing I can say for sure is all of it is basically... Um, European import ceramics mm -hmm. um, that were, you know, throughout the 1900s. There's nothing in particular, I, you know, I wish I could say like sure. very particular in this date range or produced at this time. Uh, most of it is quite large. Um, and in terms of the specific place where they were found, other than communicating with the Hirahara family themselves, mm 
mm -hmm. sort of understanding that they were, you know, going to Watson and purchasing it. I can't say for sure that anything came from a very specific place. Okay. Um, you know, we had the heirlooms within the family. Um, there are some things, you know, uh, car parts and things like that that were certainly mm -hmm. from around there in, in Watsonville. Um, but unfortunately, not not really directly from a specific place that they purchased it. Yeah, it if you it. do find yeah. something, um, because the Treasure Island Fair was a really big deal in 1939, mm -hmm. 1940, mm -hmm. and they had a very prominent um, Japan exhibition. Mm -hmm. uh, are you familiar with that? Um, not, I'm not it, it was, that familiar. They actually. built, the Japanese government actually brought over artisans, and they built this magnificent wooden castle. Wow. And so you had gardens and landscaping yeah. and bonsai and, you know, right. on. And it was a huge draw for Japanese um, mm -hmm. residents throughout Northern California, yeah. as well as quite prominent, you know, in, in, in um, for Anglos. You yeah, know, the, the that's regular. fantastic. And you know, there so. were um, Japanese grocery stores and specific right. Japanese yeah. businesses in Watsonville that we mm -hmm. sort of focused on that they probably, I could tie some things to those businesses in general. Yeah. But yeah. looking into the fair is something I'm definitely going to do. That that would, in fact, I can tell you a little bit more about some of the stuff and because mm -hmm. there's a wonderful, I yeah. interviewed a wonderful ja um, Japanese gentleman who had been to the fair, took um, film. He was living in San Francisco in Japantown, but he took film with his um, his uh, eight millimeter. And then when he was in the internment camp in Topaz, mm -hmm. he would show it. Uh, and he has this film of Japantown and also of the Japan Day parades with a U.S. and Japanese flag wow. going down. So it was it was a big deal, awesome. you know, for the yeah, Japanese community you. in Northern California. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I see a question up front and one in the back. Uh, many years ago, I visited Manzanar on my way to Deep Springs College, and I don't remember much there. There's a monument there now. Uh, recently, a Berkeley friend wanted to visit there because her ethnic background, she, she's Greek Arab. Mm -hmm. Apparently, they were very the Japanese were very kind to her group, mm. and she felt sympathy that way. Mm. Now, what's at, Mount, at Manzanar now? That's a great question. Um, I actually excavated at Manzanar in 2018, so I was there then, um, working with Jeffrey Burton, who has done a lot of great work in sort of recreating aspects of the camp. So you're absolutely right. When you look at it, you're in Death Valley, and it's 105 degrees and, and there's not really anything there. There's sort of the museum um, and some footings of some of the barracks. Um, mainly what they're doing, um, and this is sort of Jeffrey's philosophy, is he does not recreate anything unless the Japanese community specifically asks him um, for things. So I was able to volunteer and excavate there. And in doing so, there were other uh, members, Japanese members of the community who had specific barracks. This is where my family stayed in this barrack. And so we focused on that in particular. Um, um, one other thing in 2018 we were actually doing was doing the children's orphanage at Manzanar. So Manzanar was one of the largest camps um, in general in terms of population that was there. So they had, for example, a hospital and it was the only camp to have an orphanage where children without uh, parents were sent. And, you know, he said, like, I would have never done this unless it was requested of me by the community to excavate this context. And it certainly was because they had amazing photographs of the playground out front. And they're like, we want to reconstruct this and see where they were located, see where these kids were, see if there's any artifacts underneath, right, that might uh, speak to that. Um, but they do keep it very minimum. Partly that's because there is also like prehistoric Native American archaeology there, and that's uh, uh, heavily protected. And so there are a lot of areas that they can't actually excavate um, because of that. Um, mostly they do the gardens are what they're sort of recreating uh, visibly, but those are uh, fairly low, you know, and they look kind of like dugout pools in a lot of ways. So visibly looking in, you know, it might uh, look quite similar, but they have done a lot of work in terms of showing on the ground where these structures may have been and doing some uh, recreation of the gardens. You walk around, they have the monument and the cemetery there. Um, they have the uh, aqueduct, the reservoir for the water that has some like graffiti in it. I know he's published some recent papers on that. So there is a, a, a lot of ongoing stuff going on. 
Um, maybe, you know, like I, they, they keep, when I was there, there was 13 gardens. Last I heard there were 17 gardens and they, and they just keep finding them. So it is definitely sort of getting more visible over time. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Ron. Thinking about the photos that they had exhibit of Ansel Adams at the you know, be nice to see that comparison to the Dorothea Lang photos of Manzanar. Yeah. She showed people. He showed the Sparrows. <laughs> he also he's also really good at making sure native people didn't show up in the pictures of California too, like Yosemite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. That was really interesting. And I also have a similar related question on how a lot of these distinctively Japanese artifacts were obtained. So I work mm -hmm. in Japan, and so I'm very used mm -hmm. to seeing these sorts of artifacts. I've been working there for a long time, but seeing them in diaspora con um, contexts in California is, of course, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And the question is, where did they come from? To use the example of the um, the kama sickles or the nokogiri saws that you're working with, yep. for instance, I think, well, I think it would be very interesting if it can be determined. It might be difficult to track down where exactly something was purchased or in what town. But do you have any ideas or any patterns where these artifacts and the different types of tools that were being used for gardening, at things outside the family heirlooms, are these things, mm -hmm. are these objects that were being purchased in Japan and brought over mm -hmm. or brought by people who were trading them and they were sold through specialty shops sure. or Japan towns? Were they yep. manufactured here in California, perhaps? Because yep. a lot of them are, were yep. they? Um, being brought individually by family or relatives and then of course the context especially as people are facing internment how much did these sorts of artifacts or these objects tie them in their minds to Japan where people feeling concerned about the idea of using distinctively Japanese saws and how that would be seen rather than yeah. using American saws or American sickles for gardening um, I was just harsh. wondering about your thoughts on all of these questions of exchange and obtaining yeah. these Japanese yeah. goods yeah, that's an awesome question. Um, I think I'm going to take the end of that really quick. Absolutely, people were hesitant about using those Japanese forms of tools. Like I mentioned, the samurai sword that's rumored to be buried here. Um, there are um, uh, like commas, kendo sticks, uh, even just notes and letters to family from Japan um, were often burned, destroyed, documents, anything like that to tie. Um, like I mentioned, with even the texts on the walls of the farm, um, you know, we find this. Uh, is it a coincidence that this book that's hidden away in the closet behind wallpaper, tucked in all Japanese texts, is talking about a Japanese anarchist? Maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it's not. And maybe this is an example of them putting those away and minimizing that visibility uh, and that connection to the empire. Um, in terms of where they're getting these materials. Um, you know, one example, so I took the photos of the, of the, uh, of the sickles and I went to the uh, San Francisco, um, Japantown and the hardware store there that they have. They said, yeah, you know, we make these here, um, you know, uh, made in Watsonville. My, I think it's very, very likely that everything that the Hirohara family had was from Watsonville. Um, because they were living in Watsonville for a number of years before actually moving to the house, right? At least 16 years for Fumio to be born there. And unfortunately, that's kind of the time period we know the least about in their family history. But it's very, very likely that they were just going out to the Japan town in Watsonville and purchasing their stuff there. And we know that they had those gardening tools there and they would have had those accessible. Even the Koimari bowl is a, is a reproduction. Um, technically, there are very specific kilns in Japan that create these bowls that leave certain markings, you know, so they were, they knew really quick it was a reproduction, but something they've had in their family since 1915 or something like that. So in Japan at one point, but probably not these people specifically that owned it, maybe even further generations before. But um, yeah, that's that's most likely where it's coming from. So really, I just, you know focus more on this post um, incarceration period, think about changes in practices and yeah, just getting it up around where they can, I guess, yeah. Thank you, yeah, thanks. Um, so on your Densho slide, you had where people came before and after. Yep. What struck me is that the far right side of that chart, it looked like everybody who went to Tule Lake from San Francisco came back. Is that right? So yeah, the, the Wow. So the kind of 
but there's a huge caveat when we're looking at this, which is just X people um, were in San Francisco, 695. Okay. X people were there after. So the 695 people who went to Thule Lake, it could have been none of them returning and just 695 other people from any of the camps. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, so it's okay. just 695 people, Japanese people were in San Francisco before uh -huh. uh, who were sent to Thule Lake. Right. 695 people uh, return to San Francisco from Thule Lake. But, you know, other people were sent to Thule Lake who might have came to San Francisco. Right. So, right. yeah, it's a... Just happens to a be a big caveat. It happens to be exact there. Okay, um, that, they, that that struck me as pretty amazing. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. And we see Watsonville zero after, right? And it's right. wow, you know. Yeah, Tula Lake was a bad place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's you know famously the the no no camp and, and sort of used for different purposes there. But yeah, that's a great question and a very important caveat to make yeah, when yeah. we're looking at this. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other questions for Jacob? Well, let's. Sure. So maybe that's where you get flooded, you know, where that. Yeah, the Pajaro, the like the Pajaro River I mean, in Watsonville. Yeah, and the farmstead, did it actually get hit? The farmstead didn't actually get hit directly. Okay. Um, you know, they are a couple miles away from that river at that point, which really saved them. Yeah. It's really like square in the city there, in that lowland area okay. right around the river, um, a couple blocks in the yeah. city, but. You know, a devastating flood, but not um, not touching the farm. So, is the family still farming there? Is it still an active oh, great, farm? Great question. Yeah, I should mention that. Um, so today the farm is uh, owned under private property. Uh, it's used. Uh, the fields are used around it for strawberry farming, and the okay. farm company just owns it. Um, they don't do anything with it. They don't uh, go and you know, it's all fenced off and blocked off. Um, they have no problems with me showing up and walking around, you know, they're like, we're just going to be farming. So uh, that's kind of where we're at, you know. Um, luckily, they've been, you know, receptive. They're, I wouldn't say they're interested or, you know, but yeah. they've been receptive and understanding. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, right now it's just private property owned by that farm company. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great stuff. Any other questions for our speaker? Mm -hmm. Oh, Zoom. Yeah. So I, uh, let me see if I can. Ah. Turning to some Zoom questions now. Some other. Ah, I actually don't see any questions on, on the Zoom chat. Um, so here we go. Well, then let's thank our speaker for his presentation today. Thank you. Thank you.